28, here is the word of the Lord, and it reads as following. And when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowd were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. Verse 5 of chapter 8. When he had entered Capernaum, a satyrian came forward <clears throat> to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering <clears throat> terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. When I say to one go, he goes and to another come and he comes and to my servant do this and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. <clears throat> I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And when the sons of the kingdom, and while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. May the Lord have a blessing to the hearers, to the readers, but most of all, the doers of his word. I want to title this sermon, The Authority of Jesus. <clears throat> the Authority of Jesus. How many of you, when you go catch a plane, Rod, and you fly to another state. How many of you, when you board the plane, put your bags in the overhead carrier and then walk to the cockpit and tell, uh, uh, tell the captain to move over? I'm going to drive this plane. I'm going to fly this plane. Okay, maybe you don't fly. How many of you would go on to a, uh, a bus, whether a Greyhound or whatever the case may be, you're going to a destination and you tell the bus driver, move over, I'm going to drive. Okay. So some of you don't take the bus. You like the train. How many of you all take the train? And tell the conductor, hey, you need to move over. I'm going to run this train. I'm going to take us to our destination. The reality is none of you would. None of you would do that. So if you wouldn't do that to a pilot or a driver or a conductor, why is it that when we travel here in life, we try to remove Jesus from the will of authority of our life. We want to be the authority. Why is it that when we, Jesus is the authority and he's taking us where we need to go, why is it that you tell him to move and you assume authority in your life? Yeah. I don't know the answer to that, but you do. But if you're honest with yourself, I submit, I guarantee you, if you look into the inventory of your life, you assume want or want to assume more authority in your life than actually submitting to the authority of Christ. And so we're going to look into this text today in a very simple way, and we're going to look at the authority of Jesus. And here's my main point and my main point only. When Jesus is the authority of your life, he enables you to live a righteous life. When Jesus is the authority in and over and through your life, he enables you to live a righteous life. question is, is he authority over your life? Not sometimes, but all the time. We come to the text at the end of chapter seven. Jesus is again concluding the Sermon on the Mount. Next week, we're going to end and wrap up the Sermon on the Mount where he talks about how we, uh, the house of, uh, uh, how you build, what you build your house upon has implications so yes, it's a little out of order, but that's just to go along with some things we have to come down uh, in the weeks ahead. Uh, so, so he comes in the crowd. It says, after he finished saying these things, 
Go back and look at Matthew chapter seven and all the way up, I mean, excuse me, chapter five through seven. After he finished saying these things, giving them great teaching, look at this, the crowd was astonished. They were amazed at his teachings. He was teaching them as one who had authority. Now, don't, mit, don't let that word had look like it was past tense because, again, when you look in the original language, it just has to, it, it, it fit in our English so it can be read that way. But it is, they, they were amazed at one who does have authority, who is authoritative, not as their scribes were. See, you got to understand a scribe studied and memorized the scriptures. And then you all know there's a difference between someone memorizing something and actually speaking something that actually is in them. There's a difference. He was one who spoke with authority because he is authority. Now, here's what's interesting. Let us not miss this. The crowd was astonished. They were amazed. But that does not equate to commitment or to submitting to his authority. And what happens is, is that many of us are amazed at his teaching. We like some of his teaching. It actually moves us. And depending on what it says or what he says throughout his word, throughout all the word, it hits us a certain way. And we like how it feels. But yet, sometimes we don't commit or submit to his authority. So do not mistake being amazed by God and equate it to... Submission to his authority. Because how many of you all know you can, look, that's what the scribes were. And even the religious leaders at that time, they knew God's word. They memorized his word. They knew theology. They knew doctrine. Yet it did not equate to submitting to his authority. So don't you ever think for a minute that just because you know a lot of doctrine or a lot of theology, that that means that therefore you are submitted to his authority. That's not true. But it doesn't matter. That doesn't mean you downplay the doctrine in, 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 in theology. Now, understand this. I want to talk about, I want to set the foundation <clears throat> before we move forward. And the foundation is I want to lift up and show to us how Jesus is the authority and how that has implications for our lives. We see that the crowd was astonished. They knew that his, he was teaching with authority that was different than others. But then we also see in the text in, John, I mean, in Matthew chapter 8, and particularly when he encounters the centurion, meaning a, a, a soldier, a leader of the Roman army, it says in verse 9, it says that, For I too, meaning also, am a man under authority, which means that the centurion understood that Jesus had authority just like him, yet it was different because he went to the authority to ask for healing. And so what I want to see, I want us to understand here is the importance of Jesus' authority here, okay? This idea of authority, it is the highest in rank. There is no one uh, with authority. That means that his rule and his reign is over all spheres of life. Jesus has authority over heaven and earth. What he says goes. There is not one that trumps him. And we know this to be true, that there's no one greater because in Acts chapter four, it says that there is no name other than Jesus' name, one that will be saved. We also know that it says in Philippians chapter two, that it says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, get this, even the demons, even if you don't want to acknowledge his authority, you will say that he is Lord. Why? Because there's no other greater authority. His authority is unmatched. It's the reason why in Revelation 1, verse 18, he says, I am the first and the last. I was dead, but I am alive and live forevermore. I have the keys. I hold the keys to death in Haiti. He has authority. But the question is, are you submitting to his authority in your life? Understand this important, this, this idea of authority comes from the doctrine that likes to be studied. It's called the supremacy of Christ. And what this supremacy of Christ is, and this doctrine is showing how Jesus is 
the son of man, but also the son of God. He is fully man. He is fully God. He is the God man. And what we see is how Jesus submits himself under the authority of God. God gives him the authority and then Jesus delegates that authority to those he wish. Which is why Jesus applauded the centurion's faith because the, he says the centurion is acknowledging something that the Jewish leaders and people of my, in my uh, the Jewish people are not acknowledging. They're not acknowledging my authority. They're not, not in, in acknowledging in a way that it can make an impact in their life. That's why he was astonished. He marveled. He he he, he was uh, amazed at that. That's why he said, "Listen." The centurion said, "You too." He says, for I too am a man under authority. So he's, so Centurion is modeling for us. He's saying, look, I know if Caesar tells me to do something, I got to go do it. Caesar may not be present, but his word carries so much authority that I carried it out. Even so, so much so that I tell my soldiers, go do this. I tell my servants, go do that. See, Luke's account doesn't have the Centurion there. It has the Centurion's messengers there. But really, the way that Matthew writes his gospel, he wants to get straight to the point. And so, uh, and so he even is embodying this by saying, look, I'm sending my word because I'm sending my messengers to here. And he says, there's something under my, my authority here, which lets us know that there is structure. And we're going to see there's structure and ordering to God's kingdom. Yeah, that's right. right? So that means that every last one of us has something under our authority. And we're going to. And we need to steward that well. Understand here, let me drive this home. I want us to understand the importance of this, the authority of Christ. His authority, you got to understand, he's, he's the God man. And, 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 and the way his authority is it, is, it is played out in a double capacity way. We see it, one, as a human servant where he comes and he meets the requirement and expectations of that, of the office of a prophet, priest, and king. Jesus is prophet, priest, and king, and he has his authority in that realm in the human sense. But we also see how when you look throughout the gospel, Jesus also speaks as if he is God, which actually irritated the, Roman, uh, the religious leaders. Leaders, because they're like, you're putting yourself on the same level of God. What are you doing? Because the reality is Jesus is God. He, he's the co-creator and he shares the father's work. I want us to see this. Look, it'll be on the board or turn to John chapter five. Hear me. I just want to set the foundation before we get into some other application, what this looks like here. It's important for us to know. John chapter five in, per, in verse, uh, yeah, John chapter five, we're going to pick up at verse seven, uh, excuse me, 19. Here's how it reads as following. It says, so Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father's doing for whatever the father does, the son does likewise. And then he says for, in verse 20, for the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing and greater works than these will he do, uh, will he show him so that you may marvel. Verse 21, for as the father raises the dead and gives life, so also, uh, so also the son gives life to whom he wills. I want you to see there, you see that this shows, that just section shows the authority of what Christ is and that he has. So much so that even the apostle Paul spends time in Colossians, uh, opening up in chapter one, setting the foundation of the supremacy of Christ, showing Christ's authority. He says that Christ is over all things and Christ is the, um, the image of the invisible God and therefore the firstborn of all creation. Now, let's address this idea of firstborn. One, Christ was not created, okay? We got to understand that he existed before times. But the Jehovah Witnesses and other doctrines and false gods, they would like to say that he was created. That's not true. When it uses the language firstborn, what it's saying is that he has authority overall because you got to understand in the time and customs, the authority and the lineage were handed down to the firstborn child. And it was, the, it was the firstborn that had all the rights that would carry the mantle of their father. Reason why there was an issue with Jacob and Esau, right? Because he, served his, he served his, uh, gave away his birthrights, which had massive implications. So when he says that he's the firstborn of all creation, it's not that he was created. He's saying that he has the first position of authority. 
Paul goes on in to explain this even more where he says that he is before all things and in him all things hold together and he is the head of the body, the church, all right? Yes, I am the under shepherd. Our elders are the under shepherd to the chief shepherd and we submit to his authority. There's order to his kingdom family, not chaos. He is the head of the body, which means that he's the head of you, whether you're married or not. We're gonna talk about that. He's the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead. There it is. He assumes the authority even over the dead so that in everything he might have supremacy. That's what the Bible says. And I want to say this, this is important. The authority that Jesus have is not oppressive. We live in a time that we, see, listen, authority ain't necessarily bad. Authority is bad when it's misused and when it's abused. And authority is bad when you don't like it. I didn't say that. It's you don't like it because it's causing you to do something that you don't want to do. But God's authority is not oppressive. It's not choking you out. And we need to get out of that mind. And, and if I'm being honest, we live in America where that is really potent in our waters. And it's in our diet every day where you are your authority. You, you know your own truth. You can't nobody tell you nothing. You live your own way. Listen, family of God, that ain't how God operates in his kingdom. His authority gives us freedom, but we think it robs us of freedom. That's how delusional Satan has us. Because he's good and his, and his authority brings order and structure in our life. But some of us wonder why we don't have it, have structure and order in our life because we remove from under his authority. So we see this here. Now, 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 now we see, and again, this is not exhaustive, but I just showed you a little bit about how Jesus has the authority there. And let me say that this is important. If Jesus, who did not sin, is without blemish, Jesus is fully God, fully man, clothed himself in human flesh. If he then therefore is obedient to the Father, what makes you think we can't be? What makes you think that you get an, an exception pass? But we do. <clears throat> because here's what we want to do. No, let me stop. I'm getting ahead of myself. No, 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 no. Let me stop. Let me stop. I'm trying to contain myself. I get a little excited. Y'all know that. But here's what we do here. What we see now is that he has the authority. But get this. What we're going to look at now is how the authority, he sends us with authority and we ought to submit to his authority. He sends us with authority, but we ought to submit to his authority. What was very interesting here is that when you look at Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, we, most of us know it if you've been in church for a while. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you to the end of the age. But what oftentimes is we forget is that before he sends us, right before that, it says, all authority on heaven and earth is given to me. That's what Jesus says. All authority in the spiritual realm and in the earthly realm is given to me. Therefore, go. I'm sending you with authority, his authority. So you're not being sent unequipped. Here it is. In Matthew chapter 10, we see that Jesus sends the disciples and gives them authority. We see the same thing in Luke chapter 10 where he sends the 72 out and he gives them authority. And it's usually over the same thing. He gave them authority over, get this, unclean spirits to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to heal the disease and any afflictions here. Now, why is that important? That there's not a place that God is going to send you where he doesn't equip you with his authority. But oftentimes we want to go places without his authority. And then we realize why we experiencing some hot mess. All right. But notice here, even before he sends his disciples out, his apostles out in Matthew chapter 10, or even in Luke 10, right before that on the hill, on the, it says that the harvest is plenty and the labors are few. So he ain't sending you with authority without nothing to do. That means that he sends you with authority to advance his kingdom where he calls you to. But notice what also he gives you authority over. He says, I give you authority over the, uh, the demons, over the spirit to cast them out, over sickness and affliction, meaning that he gives us authority over the very thing that's trying to get us. 
And many of us experience the struggle of things because we don't, we don't deal with them according to his authority. So when he sends us, get this too, and this is important. He ain't sending you aimlessly because he also is giving instructions when he sends his disciples on what to do. Don't fool with them if they act this way. Don't do this. Don't carry this for you. He equips them accordingly. But here's what's important. I want us to realize this because this messes with our theology in Christendom because we've, we, we, we've drunk the Kool-Aid of prosperity gospel too much. He says, behold, which is very interesting. He, he's getting it. Behold, I send you as a lamb in the midst of wolves. So what that means is that although he gives you authority, you're going to encounter some hostility. So don't think that just because you're doing what God calls you to do when you're operating under his authority, you're looking puzzled on why you got some hostility. You're in, you're in the midst of wolves. He knows that. He understands that which is good news for us so that you should not be surprised that when you're living a life and fully submitting to his authority, when you encounter some hot mess and some, and some, and some, and some ragginess in your life, and the storms is going on, you don't need to be surprised when it happens because he reminds us that this will happen. Yeah. Because he also tells them, if you go back and look in the Gospel of John, he goes, in this world, you're going to have trouble. Yeah. But peace, I will be with you. Yeah. Take heart, I will be with you. What are the things that are hindering you from experiencing the fullness of God's authority? Now, let me say this. This authority that he gives us, many of us like to to pimp out his authority, all right? I'm sorry. I'm from Kansas City. I kind of grew up in the hood. Excuse me if my language don't match that well. My verbs are in proper English. It's cool. I just want y'all to know y'all pastor a hot mess and I'm off the chain. That's all y'all need to know. I'm going to just tell it how it is, and it is what it is, all right? Hold right, let me use this. People misuse his authority. Is that better? <laughs> I'm messing. Let me stop. Let me what? Oh, man, I cracked myself up. Um, <laughs> listen, listen. Um, we can misuse his authority. Acts chapter 19 in particularly in verse 11 through 16, what happens is that you have the seven sons of Sceva who are sons of a prophet, or excuse me, of a high priest. What's very interesting, let me set the context. Here's what happens. The right before verse 11, it says Paul was doing extraordinary miracles. So much so that when he walked past people, when they would touch with, with his shadow or if they would touch his handkerchief or whatever the case may be, the authority of Christ was moving through him and it was killing everything. Healing everything it was. Now, what you have is the altern- these itinerant Jewish exorcists, meaning that they will go around trying to perform exorcists to get re- remove these demons. Now, here's what's very interesting. They see Paul exercise his authority, and they go, dang, I want some of that. That look good. And so what do they do? They invoke themselves My Lord, help me, Holy Spirit, make this plain. They invoke themselves, and then they try to cast out a demon that was a person that was demon-possessed, and they go, by the Jesus that Paul pronounced, ask you to come out. First of all, they ain't even standing on the authority of Christ anyway. They piggybacking off somebody else's authority, which means many of us need to stop doing that. Amen, saints? And here's what's really fascinating. The text tells you, go back and read it. Acts chapter 19, verse 11 through 16. The demons respond. They said, wait a minute. Hold up, player. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Who you? Who you? And then the text goes on and says that they jumped on them. The very thing that they were trying to cast out jumped on them, caused them to be naked, and the idea is that it would humiliate them twice, kind of double down. One, I don't know who you are. Two, I'm about to expose you. Yeah, yeah. And what happens is, is that many of us are too busy rushing the timeline for God to use the authority in our life. Because what happens, get this, it's, it, we need to be patient because God gives us authority to be exercised at certain points in our life. But what happened was, is that these itinerant ministers saw the power being used and they wanted to rush God's timeline for their own glory. And in the midst of that, got exposed. 
Now, hear me now. I'm, get me. I've been there before. I have seen. Listen, that stuff is a, in, infectious. If you ever seen someone like operate under their authority and actually like you'd be like, oh, man, I just see somebody get healed because they lay hands on them. And you see the power in that person in present. It does something to you. And I remember those moments where I would leave in a certain situation and be like, man, I want that. I want to experience that. Now, get this. I have to pause and ask myself, do I want it so that I can get praised? Or do I want it because I genuinely want to go closer to the Lord and have him use me for his kingdom? The oftentimes is that it's not that God's not going to use you all. The problem is that too many of us are trying to rush his timeline. We're trying to get in the driver's seat and assume authority when he's saying, I need you to be patient. Because what the work I have for you is coming, but I got to take you through the valley first. Because you ain't going to appreciate and you ain't going to steward what I'm giving you unless you experience some things. So it's not by mistake that you go through what you go through. But we need to get out of this mindset thinking that God is trying to rob us from using our gifts. Just because a church ain't got a ministry for your gifts. Your gifts is not bound to the four walls. Your gift is bound to where your feet take you. And so you operate under that authority so that his kingdom can advance. Stop misusing his, king. Stop misusing his authority. Stop misusing it. Because here's the thing. It is given to all of us. He given it to the disciples. If you confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you therefore have authority in Jesus' name. Which lets us know him giving us authority ain't predicated off how eloquent you are. How much money you got. What position you got, the resources you got. His authority is given because he loves you and he wants to use you to advance his kingdom where you at at work, in your home, in your neighborhood, in your community. It is our responsibility to steward it. But here's the problem though, and this is the next one. He sends us with authority, but this is where we struggle with. We don't want to oftentimes to submit to that authority. God is a God of order. He's not out of order. I want to read to you. It's not on the board, but if you want to turn to it, you're more than welcome. Colossians chapter, uh, chapter three. I want to show you two things. I want to show you how there's authority in the homes, but then there's also authority in the marketplace. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> he says here in Colossians chapter three, starting at verse, um, I'm going to start at verse 17. He says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything. Here it is in the name of the Lord, in authority of him, giving thanks to God, the father through him. Verse 18, 18 here's, the, here's the household authority. Wives, submit to your husbands. Uh-oh. Wives, submit to your husband. Oh, this, Sierra, submit to Miguel <laughs> as it's fitting to the Lord. You see that? You know Sarah called Abraham Lord? Sierra, you got to start calling me Lord, all right? <laughs> I'm messing with y'all. I'm messing with y'all. I'm messing with y'all. It says, wives submit to your husband as is fitting for the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. Hello, husband, love your wives. Hello, husband, love your wives. Do not, oh, here it is, husband. Do do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this is pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Now, let me stop here. Understand this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Jesus also, I mean, uh, the apostle Paul also addressed this. It says, the head of every man is Christ. And so understand that the authority, the authority of every human being is Christ himself. Because get this, whether they want to accept it or not, because they're going to give an account to his authority. Okay. But more so even those who are believers. But now the wives are under the authority of the husband. Hear me. This is important. This does not mean you're less than. We live in a time where we, that, that word submit has been abused. The authority has been abused and misused. And it is my prayer that through God and his word that you don't allow the world to take what is ultimately God and to tarnish it. Submission is a good thing. Now get this. Husbands ought to submit. uh, You're over your wife, but also husbands ought to submit to the Lord. Because go back and mark this down and study this. First Peter chapter three, verse seven. Husbands ought to live with their wives in an honorable way. And if they don't, their prayers will be hindered. So you wonder why some of you husbands ain't getting no prayers handed, uh, answered. One, you ain't honoring your wife. Yeah. Two, you ain't sitting here submitting to the authority of Christ. So you wonder why she a rebel when you acting like a rebel. How does that work? Yeah. Yeah. So you think that everybody should be under you, but then you can't be under Christ. Mm-hmm. And hear me, that's not, a, and, and that's how God designed it here. Same thing, children, obey your parents. 
Notice even in that text, he addresses the father. That doesn't mean the role, the mother role is less than. It is the father's job to care for the children and to God, provide guidance and leadership for the home. Again, I need to say this because we live in a time where we live in a world where they will tell you, don't let no man submit to you. Don't use that language. That ain't, that, that, that's garbage here. That's the world's way of thinking. Now, we should not misabuse that language. That, that we should not miss, uh, people are abusing submission. They're abusing their authority. That is dangerous. Don't submit to that. God don't cause us to submit, submit to stuff that is oppressive. He don't call us to do that, okay? But children are, but the father's over the home. And so what this lets us know is that that is even in the home context. But hear me, I want to see even in the marketplace. Look what he says in verse 22. I'm still in Colossians chapter three. He says, bond servants, employees, translation, obey, every, <clears throat> obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, those who are your employers. It's translating here. Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with a sincere heart. Here it is fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work wholeheartedly for the Lord and not for man. Then he drops down to verse chapter four, verse one. He says, masters, employers, treat your employee, your bond servant, justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Yeah. You see the structure of authority? You see that there? Which means that if you find yourself here and you got people at your job that's under your leadership, it is your obligation, especially if you're a believer, it is your obligation to treat them justly and fairly in the way that Christ would want to see it be done. Because the text tells us you got a master that's over you. Sure, you got the CEO, but you have one in heaven. He went higher than that. Because at the end of the day, you're going to give an account for how you steward what he has given you. So, so, so many of us, again, wherever you at, you got stuff that's under you, under your authority, but you must not remove yourself from up under his authority. And what happens is that we want to pick and choose when we want to be under his authority. We actually treat him. We treat, listen, he owned the whole house, but we want to close doors to certain rooms to say that he can't have access to that. That's foolish. And then we wonder why we struggle because we're not fully submitting to who God is and his authority. Because even when it comes to the spiritual realm, in James chapter 4, verse 7, we, it says, we, we, we always want to get to the part where it says, the devil will re- resist the devil and he will flee from you. But right before that, it says, submit to God. Right. Submit to God. The devil, then you have the ability to resist the devil and the devil will flee. Why? Because you're submitting under authority that the devil can't trump. And it's the same thing when he talks about in Galatians chapter five, when you walk according to the spirit, are you going to walk according to the flesh? Or are you going to walk according to the spirit? When you walk according to the spirit, you are, su- you are submitting and subjecting your life, your whole being under the authority of the spirit, under the authority of the triune God. Therefore, you are able to now carry out a righteous life because the authority that you're under here. It's the same reason why he says, pick up your cross and and follow me. When you pick up your cross daily, that is a daily reminder that you are submitting to an authority that is good for you. You're sub- when you pick up your cross, it's reminding and it's embodying John chapter 15. And you're connecting that he is the vine and you are the branches because apart from him, you ain't going to bear nothing. And we wonder why we ain't overcoming and experiencing victory in our life because we, sub- we remove from the authority of God. We, we, get, we, we subject him. You can get this authority, but no, you can't get this. Because I went to school. I got a master's. I got 15 years experience on my job. I got an expertise. I know how to handle this, God. And then we wonder why our life is out in shambles when we leave the workplace. But understand here, that's why we ought to pick up our cross daily here. And I said this earlier, and I need to say this again. His authority brings so much joy. That's right. Amen. Not even in eternity, that's going to be the case. It brings joy here. His authority brings order to the mess that we have. It could be chaos all around us. But man, when you're submitting to the Lord, you could be at peace that surpasses all understanding because you're obeying his word. Why do you find yourself having subjective submission to his authority in your life? So you want people to respect your authority at work. You want your your husband or your wife to respect your authority, but yet you don't want to respect his authority. I want to hear your testimony. How does it working out for you? It's good. Stop believing the lie that God is holding out on us. 
We got to be obedient to his word and what he calls us to do, especially if you're a believer, because his authority governs all aspects of our life. Man, y'all know, y'all know I love football. Go Chiefs. You know what I'm saying? All day, every day. Um, what's interesting when you watch the game, man, NFL players, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's crazy. They're bigger. They're stronger. They're faster. You kind of get amazed. You're like, dang, how does God create, like, human beings that can do that? <laughs> I mean, I don't, you know, take something else, you know, other, other sports, or whatever. But, like, football, you're like, dang, you are 300 pounds and moving extraordinary fast <laughs> that is not of god that is, so, <laughs> hey i'm gonna just be real sometimes i look at football players i'll be like that's what nephilim's probably looked like because <laughs> these people are ungodly huge <laughs> go look at genesis chapter six or seven somewhere you'll see nephilim's and all that stuff but anyways i digress let me get on with my point but here's the crazy thing as big as they are as strong as they are as fast as they are they don't hold the authority on the field you know who holds the authority on the field? The referees who are smaller, who don't move as fast. And they hold the authority on the field because they are under the authority of the NFL that has wrote in their bylaws that on the field of play, you have the authority and govern the thing, meaning those refs can shut everything down. Why do I say that to say, because guess what? Satan's stronger than you. He's faster than you. He's bigger than you. But yet... Jesus Christ has all the authority and we get to benefit from his authority. And so he gives the authority to us, but now therefore we're able to execute that authority, even though we are in an atmosphere where things are bigger, stronger, and faster spiritually, but we cannot be moved because we're under the authority of God and he gives us the word that is living and active and therefore we're able to live it out. Why? Because we stay closely connected to the authority. And his authority is not subject to how, get this, how eloquent you talk. You got some deficiencies, okay. But you can move mountains because of the authority that you're in. Yeah. You. Now, here's important. I, want us, I don't want us to miss this. Because we live in a time, and unfortunately, you're going to encounter some ignorance at your job where they think that God is special to certain tribes. God treats certain ethnicities a certain way, and that ain't true. But here's this, though. When you look at Matthew chapter 5, Jesus' authority crosses ethnic lines. The centurion is a Roman. It's a Gentile. He ain't a Jew. And what we see here is that his, this, 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 this Gentile, this Roman is acknowledging the authority of Jesus. And guess what? Jesus is embracing that. And he says that, hey, my authority crosses every ethnic line, regardless of where you come from. I don't care what anybody in Capitol Hill said. I don't care what anybody at your job said. I don't care what your ethnicity is. Get this. You can experience the authority of God regardless of what your ethnicity is. Why do I say that? Because when you look at Matthew chapter, uh, uh, in chapter 8, he goes on to even further say, Jesus marveled at this. And then he goes on and says, truly I tell you, many will come from the east and the west. What is he talking about? Those who are not Jewish people. He said, my kingdom is going to expand beyond the folks who want to miss my authority. And so I'm going to incorporate some other folks that can see my authority. He says, and they're going to come from the east and the west. And get this. He said, they're going to recline at the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why? Because you got to understand, Matthew's talking to a Jewish audience. In the Jewish respect, they have reverence for Matthew, uh, I mean, for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he says that they're going, to, uh, uh, they're going to recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. That means that he crosses ethnic lines. His authority is not limited to a certain tribe. He encompasses all. But here's what's interesting. His authority also welcomes the uncleanliness. If you go back and look at chapter 8 of Matthew, verses 1 through 3, it says, after he came down from the mountain, a great crowd followed him. The first thing he encountered is what? A leopard who was unclean. Unclean, has a skin disease, which means that lepers probably like ostracized and, and cast out of the community. Not, 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 ain't nobody fooling with him or her. With it. Ain't nobody fooling with it. But we see the authority of Jesus welcomes the uncleanness because the leper comes, my Lord. Come, the leper comes to God, comes to Jesus, and it kneels down. And it says that if you are willing, heal me. Knelt down before him saying, Lord, if you will. Make me clean. And you know what Jesus does? Jesus stretched out his hand. T touches. 
which was a big no-no in that time. You don't do that. And healed the leper. What I mean by his authority welcomes uncleanliness, listen, that leper did not allow its circumstance to keep them from God. And I don't know who needs to hear this today. You may be feeling dirty. You may be feeling unclean because you done did some things in your life. Maybe even last night. Listen, I'm your pastor. I love you, but I know we, we, we some jacked up people. And I say that to you in love. But what that lets us know is that we ought to, we can still come to him. His authority does not discriminate against your circumstance. And so that should bring freedom because now when we're unclean, we're able to experience, this leper has experienced a transformation like no other. Why? Because it came to God and experienced his authority. And I submit to you today that when you take your life to him, regardless of what you're struggling with, and you may feel that, that, that there don't nobody want to fool with me. You don't know what I did. This lets us know that you are not, that you, that, that, that you were just uh, done to the wayside. And I need you to hear that and receive that. And his authority can transform beautiful things in your life. You just got to be willing to come. Just like the leper did. Don't allow your situation to hinder you from experiencing the transformation that his authority can provide in our life. Understand this, what an emulsifier does. An emulsifier brings two things that doesn't mix together, together. Okay? So, for example, you got water and oil. You get, that's like mayonnaise, right? Ugh. Mayonnaise. You take mayonnaise. What is mayonnaise? You got a lot of water and a lot of oil. What's the emulsifier? You throw an egg in there and now it comes together. And bless your heart if y'all like mayonnaise. Y'all are unredeemed. <laughs> My wife be like, make a sandwich. Put some mayonnaise on. I be like, you are just nasty. How dare you that? And then when I touch it, I act like I am just so unclean. Ah, just nasty. You, ugh. I'm going to pray for y'all heart that like mayonnaise. <laughs> But that's what a mayonnaise does, though. That, I mean, but again, it, it, it's create because the egg brings the oil and water together and all some other greens. That egg is the emulsifier. Well, here's what's very interesting. The emulsifier can be used, and it is in other, there's other things that are emulsifier that comes into play. So, for example, take when you go take a shower. If you go take a shower or you go take a bath and you just, uh, just go get in water, you're just going to come back. You're still going to come back dirty. <laughs> I don't know who told you that, that just hopping in the shower is, is just, you know, just putting some water, hitting, letting the water hit your body means you're going to be fully clean. There might be some parts are, but to really clean your skin, because again, there's oils and uh, your skin produces oils and then you, it got this dirt that connects the oil. And so you got all this dirtiness that comes in. But you know what's an emulsifier though? Soap is an emulsifier because what soap does, it coll- soap holds the oil so that therefore the water washes over and now is able to remove all the dirt that there is. Do you know that Jesus Christ and what he did on Calvary is an emulsifier for you? Because your sins was held and nailed to that cross. And it was the blood that flowed from the highest mountain that cleansed you and makes you white as snow. So now you are able to be brought near because Christ is the emulsifier. Now you are able to experience reconciliation in your family because Christ is the emulsifier. Now you are able to see fruitfulness in your family, in your neighborhood, in the church, because he took two people who didn't like each other and now now they are living in harmony because Christ is the emulsifier. He takes you who you think can't be used, and yet when he look at your sin that's on the cross, guess what? And he says, I love you, and it is finished. He's able to bring you near and use you. Why? Because Christ is the emulsifier. Stay under his authority. Don't leave it because it ain't, he ain't neglecting you. Stay up under that. And here's the last thing as we get ready to close. This is so beautiful. I pray I don't cry. The authority of Jesus has no jurisdiction. The authority of Jesus has no jurisdiction. Well, you say, what do you see that at, preacher? The centurion said, don't you come down to my roof. Just say the word. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. And when you look at the text, Jesus says, go for it is done because you believe. And then it says the servant was healed that very moment. Jesus is a physical person, family. He never stepped foot in that man's house, but yet his word traveled in such a way that was able to heal the very person, even though he was here. Why is that good news? Christ is at the right hand of God, family, sitting on the throne. But yet his word is living and active, sharper than two, any two-edged sword, able to pierce even the very joint and bone and marrow that we have. Just say the word and it'll be healed. 
Get this, if you can communicate to someone who's in a different time zone through text message, if you can communicate with someone through text message in another country, what makes you think that our God doesn't have an authority to be able to heal the very darkest places where he can go? So surely if you can communicate, and last time I checked, our God is better than technology. So what that lets us know is that his word is very living and it's active. Always, some of us, we miss what he's doing because we don't call on the living word. He give us a word and sometimes, get this, and it's through his presence, through the power of the Holy Spirit that is with us and it keeps us, but we miss it because we don't run to his word. You need to start speaking some God's word over your life. You're speaking that authority over there. And what it shows us is that his authority don't have no jurisdiction. And I'm going to say it again because many of us think that he can't touch the raggedy places of your life. And that ain't true. Say the word. He said, if you just say the word, it will be done. That's why you need to know his word. Sometimes you got to remember scriptures and sometimes you got to remember what he says, how he says that you will be a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. You got to remember what he says in Psalms 107, 20. Set out, he says, I sent out my word and I heals them and it delivers them because his word has no, his authority is not bound by time and space. So I ask you today, where do you need, where are you not submitting to the authority of God in your life? When you submit to the authority of Jesus over your life, in your life, through your life, you, he will enable you through the power of the spirit to live a righteous life. And get this, and when you live a righteous life, oh, I can't wait. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Yep, you fell down, but well done, my good and faithful servant. Yep, you messed up, but you were faithful. Well done, my good and faithful servant. God is not in the business of looking for perfection, but he is in the business of people submitting to his authority. That's what he is in. He is in the business of us being faithful. And when you submit to his authority, you will. His power, his word does not come back void. You will, he will enable you to live a righteous life that is pleasing, holy, and acceptable unto him. So may we be a family, may we be a church that if we do nothing else, submit to the authority of God so that we can experience fruitfulness in our community, in our homes, in our neighborhoods.